So what we've done so far is having, a, we've mixed some serious physics with uh, serious observations, and sometimes the mixture is uncomfortable. But the idea is that, of course, we're dealing with natural phenomena, and it's good to have some physical uh, guide through the data. So what I'm presenting is uh, the physics and an interpretation of observations. But I think the physics are always there. And of course, there's, you must always allow for alternative explanations. But the idea is that when you have uh, some systematics that you've done in the field is to look for some of the underlying <laughs> physics. You might have an alternative physics, but I think it's the best way to guide through you through the observations. So the models I've presented, and some of the models I'm going to present should not be considered as true. So the physics are true, whether they do uh, account for what's happening in one particular system, of course, is is open to discussion. So the last bit is we're going to stretch the time scale a little bit more and talk about how magma reservoirs get in place and how what happens to them as they get larger. And I think that's an important part that's, that you have to deal with, that we have so the plutonic record. Now, plutons are fully solidified uh, magma reservoirs. Whether they were once volcanic reservoirs is open to question. In some cases, I will mention them briefly, you can associate them with volcanic deposits. So it's clear that they fed volcanics. And you can demonstrate that the volcanics are indeed compatible with the composition of uh, the fully crystallized body. That has been shown in the, the very large uh, intrusion called the Bushveld in South Africa, which I will mention briefly. So in many cases, it's quite clear that these plutons did act as magma reservoirs. And they're usually found in clearly uh, magmatic and volcanic areas. So that plutonic record needs to be uh, understood and needs to be accounted for. So we start again with the same diagram. You're sick and tired of it, but uh, it's a good diagram. So on the whole, we know that we've been placed in the crust magmas that, that did differentiate. That's what we see in volcanoes. And we know that the bulk composition of the continental crust is evolved with respect to primitive magmas, which are always basaltic in compositions, regardless of whether you look at them in over big uh, mantle plumes or whether you look at them in subduction zone. They're always initially basaltic. And, and yet we end up something which is uh, between andesite and dacite. So there's two things that you need to do is to differentiate your mafic magmas. But then you, if you want to get the residue which is fully evolved, then you have to get rid of the most mafic part. That's always been an issue. And so I think on the, on the whole, you can see that we know that somehow we've got to two stages in the evolution of a magmatic reservoir. We have the differentiation. And we see that in an active volcano. We saw that at Mount Adams, for example. But then there's an, a final phase in which we have, we have to uh, lose some of the mafix. <coughs> Now, whether these are very separate in time or not is an, is an open question. So we know that magma ascent is buoyancy driven. So we know that we're in placing magmas. I will show you examples that magmas either rise to some level, and many of them get in place uh, at shallow depths, maybe due to the edifice, also maybe due to the fact that they encounter rocks that are less than tandem. So, and I will show you one example. That's, uh, uh, and that's based on a gravity survey of the rum intrusion in Scotland. I will show you uh, another uh, photograph later on about the, this intrusion. That's a mafic intrusion. And uh, it has, what is left now is the mafix. So what you have is the, uh, the cross section that was built other on surface observations and gravity survey. The deeper part, uh, given the uh, coarseness of the gravity survey, is not reliable. We'll come back to that later on. The shallow part is uh, reliable. Gravity survey is, is uh, given the uh, scope and the um, size of the survey. You, you have enough resolution for the shallow system. You have the dips of the. You can see that this uh, magma reservoir got in place close to the interface between the uh, supercrustal, the, the sedimentary copper. And uh, you can see that it did deform it. And we'll come back to that later on. What's left now, interestingly, 
there is some volcanics in the area, and volcanics are clearly, uh, you can show they're cogenetic with this type of liquid. They might not have come for that particular system, but there's a lot of volcanics in the, in the area. You can see what's left now is uh, very dense, and that's one of the problems I would come back to that. What is left is the mafic part, the fully crystallized part, and uh, this is much denser than the country rock. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be, the story is going to be, emplacement is dictated by the density of the initial magma, and as the magma evolves, then we, the, what's left in the reservoir changes, and it changes in density. So first, uh, phase one is emplacement. So if you look at the rum, you can calculate the uh, initial, uh, that's for a dry magma. There were some volatiles, but we don't know that. So it's dry magma. Uh, we calculate that the pressure at which it was emplaced. So you do that by uh, using some codes like the melts. Uh, in fact, that comes from the melts uh, petrological code, which allows you to figure out what's crystallizing out of an uh, initial liquid at any pressure. You do have to specify the uh, uh, the redox state, but uh, this is standard redox condition. And this is what you have for the incoming magma for the rum. You can uh, isolate the incoming magma from uh, primitive dikes that are found uh, around the body. And that tells you, uh, as a function of temperature, what happens to this magma. So that's the bulk, residual liquid plus crystals. And this is the crystal cargo. And of course, there are breaks in the curve depending on the, uh, on the, the crystals that appear on the liquidus. But you can see the basic story is that as you differentiate, you start initially with a magma that was not very dense, about 2.65 per salt, and then it differentiates and then becomes denser and denser. And of course, the crystal cargo is even denser. Very, very large uh, amounts of mafix. And here you crystallize a lot of plagioclase, which is less dense, which is responsible for this. Uh, but all, overall, you can see the big bulk uh, density change that occurs in a reservoir like this. Now, of course, this is erupting, so the story is going to be more complicated than this. But the basic story is going to be still going to be the same. You have a, a density increase as a function of time. Now, you can see this. Uh, I've summarized a few intrusions for you. That's a small intrusion which I'll talk a little bit about because it's smaller and it's been looked at in the field, uh, in Scotland also. And there's no information there, but uh, it's about the same system and the rum, and we have other information later on. The rum is there. So the host rocks, is, they are well documented in the rum. The incoming magma was about probably there. You can see that the, the density was intermediate between uh, the density of the supercrustals and the density of the uh, crystalline basement. Cetil is a very large intrusion in Quebec, very large mafic intrusion, beautiful intrusion. Again, we do know the uh, surrounding rocks very well. And you can see the incoming magma had, uh, was probably slightly buoyant with respect to the country rock. The bush veld in South Africa is an even larger intrusion. And again, the same story. The incoming magma had a density was the intermediate between those and the country rock. And you can see that in all cases, the density of the fully crystallized assemblage that's left, the mesh accumulates are much denser than the host rocks. So there's a very large density change between the initial liquid system and initial fully crystallized mafic cumulate pile. So there's going to be a second phase in which there's sagging and foundering. And they might not be separate in time. But of course, for what I will do, I will, I will consider them separately. Or so to go back at the rum, this is what you have. That's a, there's a fault that runs through the system. You can see the size of it. That's important to have the lateral extent. And uh, we have good controls on the lateral extent, even at depths. You can see it's slightly larger at depths than uh, just at the out on the outcrop. There's a fault that runs through the system. For those of you interested in it, it's a beautiful, uh, uh, it's a beautiful outcrop. There's some interesting layered series, but I will, will not go into that here. And this is characterized by a big gravity anomaly. You can see the coarseness of the gravity is not great. And that's an island. And of course, there's not a, not a lot of gravity data uh, at sea, unfortunately, but uh, it would be very nice to have more gravity data on those systems because gravity data, are, of course, uh, going to tell us a lot about what's going on. The Ardnamaker system, that's a Google Earth system. You can see this uh, circular outline. There's a, the erosion level has just cut through the magma body. And uh, so therefore, you can do quite a lot of mapping. The lateral extent is about six kilometers. 
And that's from a nice paper which summarized. So the, that's the present level of exposure. There's no gravity data, so you must definitely think that uh, all this is uh, imaginary. But the important thing is that you can see here that uh, it's definitely a thicker body because of the dips. So that's what uh, petrologists call lopolis, which is a basin-like structure which is thicker at the, uh, in an actual zone. But what's not clearly like lapolis, and I'll come back to that, is that the tilting of the magnetic layers, uh, um, the, the inward tilting increases as you go towards the, uh, the axis. And that's, I think, a very important piece of evidence. But it's a nice intrusion. It's also uh, in interesting because it does, it's not a very large volume intrusion. So there's an aspect ratio associated with that intrusion, which will play a role. The thickness is a few kilometers, and the width is about a few kilometers. So the aspect ratio is about one. Now, do, uh, how can we place a reservoir like this? If you put them very fast, uh, there's a big issue about how you can deform it. In the post crystallization phase, the whole system has been heated up. We know uh, there's a stress that's going to be imposed by the mafix. We know the, the amount of uh, a rough estimate of this stress magnitude is simply uh, given by delta rho, the density contrast of the country rock, G times the thickness of the, of the intrusion. We know the density contrast. That's very well documented. The intrusion thickness is also quite well documented. And we know the rheology of uh, crust of rocks. And, uh, uh, I'll show you the examples. You, 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 you may assume several uh, uh, constitutive relationship between stress and strain rate. But uh, basically, for these stresses, these things are uh, characterized by effective viscosity that are in a range such that the strain rates are large. So these bodies will deform. So just to give you an idea, of, and that depends on temperature. So this is an effective viscosity for that uh, given stress level that I was mentioning. These are nonlinear biological laws. And so um, the divertic stress magnitude was calculated as I shown previously. As you can see, as a function of temperature, you can have very small effective viscosity. So country rock will deform if it's carried to temperatures basically above 400 degrees C. It depends, of course, on the exact uh, constitutive relationship between stress and strain rate. But the story is that if you heat up the rock, they will deform over small time scale geologically. You, you can relax uh, the stresses in a, in a few uh, tens of thousand years at this rate. So in placement, first phase. And the one thing you see is that there's a relationship between volume and aspect ratio. So this is the outnumber current intrusion, small volume, 30 cubic kilometers, aspect ratio of order one. Rum intrusion that I've shown previously, larger volume, 500 cubic kilometers, aspect ratio of 0.5. Cetil, this beautiful intrusion in uh, Quebec, uh, it's around, uh, it's unfortunately, only bits of it are found on the outcrop, and most of it is under, under the uh, St. Lawrence River, but you, this has been mapped using gravity anomaly. Uh, almost perfectly circular outline, beautifully. Uh, and uh, large volume, very large intrusion, aspect ratio smaller. The bush veil, this is even larger. That's in South Africa. That's older. This is about 60 million years old. The uh, settled intrusion, I forgot now. It's about, I forgot. About maybe, uh, sorry, I forgot. It has to be somewhere linked to the uh, St. Lawrence River, so maybe 400 million years ago. Anyway. And the Bushveld is about 2.0 giga years ago, so 2 billion years ago. It's a much larger system. And the outcrop is, uh, goes, you can see, it stretches over about 400 kilometers. It has an irregular outline, which I think is an important thing, but an average aspect ratio is about 0.04. So you can see there's a relationship between volume and aspect ratio. And that's one thing that I'd like to emphasize. So we've, we've done experiments, and I will show you some simple theory to, to account for to find out how you can uh, inject a magma reservoir and what determines the, uh, the aspect ratio that you see. So you inject uh, liquid at the interface between the two layers. It's a stably stratified system. The upper layer is less dense than the uh, lower one. And we initially inject a liquid that's uh, hot. And uh, at its high temperature, its density is between these two densities. So it will it will get in place right at the interface. 
But when it cools down, it will become denser than the uh, lower layer uh, material, and then it will sink. So that's a simple way of representing uh, the big density change that I uh, that, that I explain that is due to cooling and crystallization. It's a very simple way, but I think it, it tells you a lot about what happens in terms of physics. So you record this. That's the tank. And these are tricky experiments because you have to monitor density to uh, a few parts per thousand. So it's a big, uh, but uh, you can do it if you're careful. So f let's first do the physics. So now we're in placing uh, 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 system. Let's assume first that it's uh, constant viscosity, constant density, and uh, you implace it at, uh, at the interface between two fluids. And uh, we might allow for different viscosities in the upper fluid and lower fluid. They have different densities. It's stably stratified, so density here is less than this one. And the intrusion has a viscosity that's intermediate between the two. So we're going to write down this exactly the same balance equations that we wrote before. So you, we've seen them, so it's just, I will go fast. It's the same type of argument. Drying force is buoyancy. Resisting force is the viscosity at the top and bottom of the intrusion. Now, the interesting thing here, of course, that we're, we have a continuity of, uh, of uh, velocity at the interface. So we're driving flow in the surrounding liquids. And the important thing is that we're driving flow over a vertical extent, which is uh, scaled to the lateral extent of the flow. That's simply a result of the fact that in the Navier-Stokes equations, your Navier-Stokes equations, that's initial terms. And you're, you have a Laplacian. So the Laplacian imposes that what happens in one direction affects in the other direction about the, over the same kind of uh, length scale. So. That's an important thing. So you, you'll have uh, the strain rate, which is going to be linked to the uh, spreading rate over that thickness. And that thickness is scaled to the radius of the intrusion, the radial extent. So for flow radial distance r, kinetic boundary radial extent is this r. The characteristic velocity, we'll call that us. Now it's not u, uh, the subscript, spreading velocity, uh, because I'm going to compare this to another velocity. So the strain rate is us over r. And the bulk momentum balance, we've seen this before. It's exactly G prime is the scaled gravity given the, the stratified system, but it's G for all practical purposes. And there's some stress at the top and bottom, so you have to allow for the two sides. So there's two viscosities involved. You add the volume conservation. It's a constant volume flow. And uh, you, you get these uh, spreading relationships. So same stuff as before, no, no particular. The important thing is that you'll see that the radial extent will increase as t to the 1, 5. And the thickness of the flow will, will uh, decrease because it's a constant volume. So it's the same thing as the constant volume flow at the surface, which was spreading and becoming thinner as, as it spread. Here it's in between two layers, but it's the same principle. And you can see a very simple set of uh, relationships. That, of course, was assuming there was no cooling. So just to give you an idea of what happens in, in an experiment. That's a side view and a view from the top. So we, we're putting a fluid which, whose density is intermediate between these two densities when it's hot. So it spreads. But you can see that uh, uh, it spreads, then it starts deforming, and then it starts foundering. And it starts foundering because it has cooled. And as it cools, of course, it has to go back down. And you can see that view from above. Initially, it does spread. You see this radius here is larger than here. And then uh, we'll show you later on is that uh, when it starts to uh, go back down, the radius will, uh, will go back down because, of course, you have to feed this downward going flow. So this is what you see. That's the uh, radial extent of the flow as a function of time. These are scaled because you want to compare experiments uh, independently of the volume, the viscosities. But, uh, if you're dealing with one experiment, it's just a straight radius in, uh, in typical units, uh, time units. You can see that this thing is spreading, and then eventually it starts to sag when it's becoming denser. So what I'm interested in is the aspect ratio at, at the stage where these things is reached its maximum lateral extent. So it's a maximum aspect ratio that you can reach before it starts to sag. And that's what you, what you find from the experiments, the aspect ratio it's the thickness over the radial extent as a function of a dimensionless number, which I'll describe later on. So we have data for 12 experiments. 
And uh, you can see there's some relationship in between the two, which I will uh, explain. But uh, so 12 experiments is a lot of time because these are tricky experiments. So uh, what, what can we say? Well, the end of the spreading phase is such that the cooling proceeds faster than spreading. Initially, if you spread fast, then cooling will affect slightly the flow. You remember, we had this when we dealt with the lava flow morphology. But eventually, uh, the, the spreading rate has got to decrease. We have a constant volume. So as the flow becomes thinner, it has to go slower. And so uh, eventually, we're going to have cooling that proceeds faster than spreading. If cooling sp spreads faster than spreading, this is the time at which basically you're not going to be able to spread much farther. And then you're going to start sinking because the cooling will overtake spreading. So the cooling rate for some thickness H is uh, is simply a diffusion control. So kappa is the mode diffusivity. So that's a cooling rate. The spreading rate you can calculate for what I've shown previously. And the cooling time for buoyancy reversal is such that the cooling rate is equal to the spreading rate. There's a to some constant of proportionality, and that defines a critical time at which basically cooling overtakes the spreading. So you know that time, that uh, you know you have the spreading relationships that specify how the radius and the height uh, increase with time. So you substitute the, this critical time in those values. And that tells you the critical aspect ratio, uh, which is there. And uh, the nice thing is that time disappears, of course. And uh, the only thing that you have left is a simple relationship, which introduces this dimensionless number, where gravity is reduced gravity and uh, time velocity. And that's a dimensionless number. That's basically a measure of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, propensity to spread and the efficiency of cooling. You can see that kappa, if kappa increases, this thing decreases, etc. So a very simple relationship. For those of you who like a convection, it just looks like a ready number. And the predicted slope was 1 minus one third, and you can see that we can calculate for these experiments, and that's the best fitting relationship. The experiments are not as good as you would like them to be, but uh, you can see basically that the basic argument is is okay, and that tells you that the aspect ratio is is uh, going as uh, this number times uh, to the power one over three. So that's important thing. AI was increasing with uh, V, so that tells you that if the volume increases, the aspect ratio decreases. And that's basically buoyancy-driven flow. The thicker the flow, the faster it goes. And so the, the larger it can spread. So you can rationalize this number, again, by a simply a ratio between two velocity scales, spreading rate versus cooling rate. It's the same argument. And uh, you can interpret, therefore, this uh, number as a ratio between uh, spreading over diffusion, cooling. So if, if this number is large, spreading is faster than cooling. Intrusion extends to large distances. Small air, cooling is faster than spreading. The intrusion doesn't spread very far. So I think that explains the relationship that we saw between the uh, intrusion size, the intrusion volume, and the aspect ratio. It's a very simplified argument, of course, because we must feed these volumes into, into crust. And crust is not infinitely thick. So. This is a very simple physical argument, but it does bring home the point, I think, that the largest intrusions are associated with the faster propensity to spread, and they will go to large distances. So the Bushveld is very large, and the Bushveld extends to 400 kilometers. The Arden American is a small intrusion. It can't spread very far, and it chills before it can spread. So that's already telling you that the size of the reservoir, its thickness, its lateral extent, there is some control on cooling by cooling. Of course, in nature, it's, there's going to be uh, complications to that, but uh, that's a basic story. Now, phase two, sagging and foundering. So now we, we have this thing has been cooling. It's, it's going to uh, become denser than the uh, surrounding rock. So if it's denser than the surrounding rock, it will go down. And so I think there's a, it's interesting also that there's, a, there's a clearly a trend in the complications uh, in the, the way the foundering proceeds. So a small intrusion, regardless of what goes on, this is going to be a, associated with a small negative buoyancy, because the small volume buoyancy is the force is the density difference times the volume times gravity. So, and you can see here there's a, 
the classical structure is interpreted as a low police, which is interpreted as sagging of the floor. But uh, the, the fact that the tilting of, of the planes increases as you go towards the axial zone is not consistent with the flexural type of deformation. It's more consistent with the foundering, the fact that you start sinking. So the sagging, I think, is a, an, another uh, the correct way of describing this, because the inward dips increase towards the axial zone. It's not consistent with some flexure of the floor. And it suggests an incipient foundering process. If you go down to other intrusions that are larger, that's a very beautiful uh, intrusion called the Great Dyke in Zimbabwe. And that's very well mapped because it's, uh, it hosts uh, lots of interesting mineral deposits, including plat platinum deposits. And that's the cross structure through the, uh, the Great Dyke of Zimbabwe. So it's very well characterized uh, because you have uh, a long strike of the dike. The dike extends over a total distance of 500 kilometers. So you have, uh, depending on uh, where you stand, you, you, you have uh, uh, observations at different levels. And we'll come back to that later on. But so basically, you have the, uh, you know, the tilting of the igneous layers. And you have the basic uh, structure from the gravity anomaly. The observations, we'll see them later. They, they, they stop short of about this level. So classically, this is interpreted as an, a feeding structure. That's a feeder zone. I think it's a wrong interpretation. I will come back to that. I think that's a foundering feature. As a feeder zone, it's just too wide. You have a kilometer-wide system here, and a kilometer-wide fracture that would feed magma. It's just way too big. It would, uh, it would uh, allow buoyancy-driven flow at uh, faster than the speed of light. So this is not a proper uh, width. I think it's a foundering feature. And uh, clearly, uh, you have a different shape. You can see that uh, maybe the Adna Merkan is an intrusion that's uh, recording some of that feature, but stopped before it reached that point. And so there's, there's a suggestion of an increasing deformation with increasing volume, sagging, funnel structure, sinking. If you sink completely, then of course you have no record left. The other, the other thing we can see, there's, um, there's complications when the, when the reservoirs are very, very large. That's the bush veil. And there's an interesting story for those of you who are interested in this, in the, about the way the gravity uh, anomalies were handled. It took about uh, two decades to sort out the, the story here. But that's the end story. It's been checked by gravity anomalies local and large scale. Uh, it's also been checked by seismics, because uh, that's hosting the largest platinum deposits in the world. And that's the story now. But uh, 20 years ago, you, this was not established, because the gravity data was, had been misinterpreted. And for those of you who are interested, I can, we can discuss that maybe in a discussion session. And that's the structure that you see. You can see this thing is uh, extending over very large distances. I think that's uh, on account of its large volume. These larger intrusions can spread very far. But it's very regular. It has lobes, northern lobes, western, eastern lobe, southern lobe. The southern lobe is uh, below the, uh, the sedimentary layers. Uh, in cross-section, it has a complicated shape. And interestingly enough, there's a difference between the basal series, the most mafic parts, and the, there are ultramafics. Basically, you have dunites and Paroxenites, for those of you who like these types of rocks. And then uh, la later on, you have pedotites. You have more complex uh, mineral assemblages. But the central part is missing the ultramafics. Very interesting. There's a general lobulous shape. And at the edges, when you have a lot of nice gravity data, which is not always the case, you have these uh, very thick lobes at the end. The lobes are thicker at the, at the terminus. And that's also a very, so you can see a complicated shape. The central part of the intrusion, which is thinner, and which has lost some of the ultramafics. And uh, a thickening of the edges. You can also track the, uh, the dips of the layers and the edges. So there's the inward dipping layers over there. And so there's quite a bit of information about uh, the structure. So I think uh, clearly the story is a sequence of increasing deformation with increasing volume, complex shapes for small aspect ratio intrusions, even more complex for large aspect ratio intrusions. So we go back to our experience and see the kind of flow patterns that we can develop. Because now we have to deal in 3D. And uh, so smaller volumes, you have small aspect ratios. You're in a teardrop regime where you just develop this teardrop. If you think in terms of the, of the funnel-shaped structure like the Great Dyke, it doesn't stretch the imagination. 
very fast, you see that this is consistent with these type of uh, shapes. But if you increase the volume and the size, these things will spread farther, and you get into a very complicated pattern. So that's a uh, side view. There's a reflection of the light, so it has a complex low, but it's only uh, spreading in that direction because of reflections of light at the uh, there's a too complicated thing here. But then you can see from the top what happens. That is what we call the jellyfish regime. It's nicely outlined in the view from the top. What you have is thickening at the edges. And uh, the edges start sinking. But there's also uh, this pattern of uh, lobes going down. These are what you might call diapers going down in the center and producing this very spectacular pattern. And then eventually it goes down. You can see the, the ring starts to become unstable to smaller scale instabilities, and there's drops forming out of the periphery. So beautiful picture. And uh, this is perfectly uh, controlled. You can make experiments with slightly, slight variations of volume, etc. I'll come back to that later on. It's a perfectly reproducible pattern. And what you see is, therefore, you look at the thickness as a function of distance at different times, 6, 20, 24, and 34. And this is what you see. Initially, the flow start to spread, but then it starts to become unstable and it starts to thicken towards the edges and thinning in the, in the center and uh, then uh, developing into this uh, jellyfish pattern. So the jellyfish pattern, uh, you can observe it at different volumes, so within the uh, limitation of the experience you, you have only a factor of about five between the smallest volume and largest volume. And of course, the larger the volume, the larger the structure, and of course, the bigger the, uh, the structure that you form, bigger diapers. So there's some nice scaling that come out of that. There's a simple physical control on that, of everything that goes on in the system. There's another regime that develops when you have a slight difference in the viscosity ratio between the intrusion and the surrounding material. And instead of producing the jellyfish, you only thicken at the center and it's a matter of just a wavelength of the most unstable uh, uh, instability that develops. And it's only thickening at the edges, and you develop these low base structures. Thick, thick at the edges, low base structures. But it's a bit, you can call that as a variant of the jellyfish regime. I'm not going to develop uh, the why there's different regimes. Uh, there's the aspect ratio is an important feature. You only develop these regimes, these complicated regimes, at large aspect ratios for very good reasons. Uh, we'll, I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, we're going to track uh, uh, these regimes and we're going to try to find the equivalents in, the, in nature. So this is what you will see, so small volume, so large a. <coughs> they will produce a teardrop regime. If you have uh, larger volumes, you will produce larger, smaller aspect ratios, and you will go into these regimes here. So larger volumes, larger values of AR, smaller aspect ratios. And the break is about there, but uh, definitely there's more theory to be handled uh, of the, these different regimes. So the story is that the larger the volume, you will produce the largest intrusions, and you will produce the most complex patterns. It's, no, it's not really that surprising. And again, these patterns are Nicely developed. I think this is very uh, similar to the low bait pattern that we had in the annular regime. You produce these thick, thicker edges and these low bait structures. And uh, it's uh, tempting to associate with this type of structure that we had. And uh, in, in the idealized cross section with staining, it's a bit idealized because uh, there was no gravity data at this stage. It's clearly thickened at the edges. And it's exactly what we have in these structures, the low bait structures and thicker edges. And I'll come back to that later on with a slightly better models for these structures. So what we've seen is that the intrusions are things that might evolve with time. They will evolve slowly, slowly with respect to the time scale of an eruptive sequence. These things are, if we are right about the, the typical viscosities and typical rates at which the cross walls can deform, you will change the dimensions, thickness, size of your reservoir over time scales that are maybe some things like 100,000 years. And so this is an important uh, factor. And so this, uh, this is slow compared to uh, the time scales for the volcanic system itself. But it's something to be 
taken into account when you want to interpret the ignis record. We have the ignis record of the protons. The protons are recording the final stages of a, a volcanic system. And so, of course, it, it is not uh, exactly what happened during the volcano, but it is recording things that did happen as the volcanoes were active. Now, the last thing the experiments I've done, I've shown you before, they show you these very complicated patterns that can develop. There's just an inst typical instabilities that you would expect in stratified fluid systems. No surprise there. The pattern, however, like this, were, were, were never described before because then it involves the uh, spreading and the cooling and the thickening at the edges. Things like this have never been reported. But uh, these instabilities are in fluid layers. So as soon as you've got some buoyancy force, the fluid deforms and everything goes down. So the end result of all our experiments was all the, the fluid ended up at the bottom of the tank, which is not what happens in nature. Because in nature, the rocks can deform, but the rocks have some strengths. So the rocks can sustain strengths. And we, of course, we see protons. The protons are there. They're shared with gravity anomalies. So they represent a load on the crust. And this load, in the case of the Bushveld, this load has been there for about 2 billion years. So it's safe to say that the crust has been able to withstand that load. And so we have to go uh, to more complicated uh, physical considerations to see what is the preserved shape that you can get. So what I'm going to show you is a result of numerical calculations done with a code that handles elastic deformation, brittle deformation, and uh, <coughs> plastic deformation, ductile deformation. So uh, I can't describe the code in any detail. It's been checked. We checked it against the laboratory experiments that is in the limit of uh, no elastic behavior, no brittle behavior, and a purely Newtonian relationship between stress and strain rate. It does uh, reproduce things. It's a 2D code, so uh, because, uh, and it's, it takes quite a bit of time to run calculations. But uh, this code is going to be able to show us what happens when the, the reservoir goes unstable, but also what is left because the shape of the body that will be left is the shape of the body that can be sustained by the strengths of the rocks. So what you have is, uh, that's the basic setup of these calculations. We um, mostly did calculations over the crust. So at the base of the crust, we allow for deformation of the crust. If you deform the crust, you have a restoring force because the crust is buoyant with respect to the underlying mantle. So this is so-called Winkler restoring forces. So you deform the crust, there's a, a push-up because you're trying to push buoyant fluid into a denser fluid. Um, and the, at the axis, by symmetry, there's no velocity. You can't spread away from nowhere. Because, uh, and uh, no shear stress because it's a maximum. And uh, at the far edges and the, the calculations, we made sure that they were not influenced by the lateral boundary. At the top, we have a free surface. The free surface can deform, so we can allow for the deformation of the surface, and that's included in the calculation. So we start with an intrusion. We start with a half width of L. Now, it's not a radial intrusion. It's 3D of a thickness H. We're going to track deformation using uh, several layers. So these layers are initially the, the rock has the same as density rho i, so we're not allowing for different densities between the different layers. But the color scheme will just allow us to track deformation as this thing goes down. And initially, uh, this thing is, uh, we start at the stage where the intrusion has spread. It's now denser than the, than the country rock, and we're going to follow what happens. Again, a stratified system, and we're going to track deformation now. So we're only looking at the foundering stage, not the initial emplacement stage. So we, we found three regimes. One is a sinking regime. If you're dealing with a big density difference and or very weak surrounding rocks. And weak surrounding rocks can be either because the rheology is intrinsically weak. Depending on the rheology, you can be weaker than others. But also, you can change that by temperature. These two can uh, offset one another. So you have weak country rock or big buoyancy force. Then you sink and you don't leave much uh, at uh, your initial emplacement. So that's the initial intrusion. And uh, it starts to sag. It starts. And then it develops this very uh, thin uh, downgoing, uh, you might call that dive here. And in that particular case, we're spreading at the, at the moho, 
is that the basal crust, and we can discuss that later on if you want to. That's a, also an interesting phenomenon for crustal differentiation, but that's outside uh, of the, this uh, talk uh, plan. And that's the temperature, nothing particular. That's the temperature field, and you can see this thing deforms. Now, I would like to stress the fact that you can see the time scale, hundreds of thousand years. Uh, the rheology is just a rheology that's a soup for crustal rocks, and the load is the load that we know. So there is deformation, unless these calculus are completely far off, uh, it's exactly what would be predicted. And you can see that, uh, indeed, uh, this initial state is not stable. It has to go and deform into these, uh, these bodies. We, are, we haven't imposed deformation there at all. Uh, the other thing I'd like to uh, stress is that, uh, in this particular case, not much is left at the initial emplacement level. And then at 500,000 years, there's still a bit of deformation, but not much. So what you're going to be left with is this very thin sliver of stuff uh, over a very thin uh, zone, which might be taken as a dike, actually. The temperature field is uh, you start hot because your reservoir is hot, and of course it sinks. And of course, it's, there's a advection of heat as you go down. But, uh, and of course, that's. Uh, uh, the, uh, the intrusion, because it's hot, heats up the surrounding rock and weakens the surrounding rocks. So because why does the green layer rise vertically on the back? Because you, the no, because you have the, the you have the return flow over this. So yes, that's the yeah. question. Why is yeah. it rising on the left and not the right? Which one? Yeah. Over here. The bottom picture. There's uh, you, there. Yeah. There it's okay. Everything is entrained by this thing, so it's these things here. And because you've got this temperature difference here, there's a bit of uplift there also. It's, you know. it's a thermal uplift. Yes, it's a thermal yeah. Did your intrusion out on the moho? Sorry? Your intrusion here, we sort of on the moho? Well, OK, we'll discuss that later. Because I'm not allowing for uh, my, my boundary calculation stops here, so the only way I can go is there. Okay. So depending on the density of this thing, it, in reality, this will continue to go down if it's denser. And the mantle, and it might spread if it's. Because we're, we're very deep. You're here. I've taken a cross of 60 kilometers thick. Yeah, that's the cross is 60 kilometers thick here. Yeah. But you can change the cross of thickness. The if you, I'm not sure what you want to drive at. There's two things here. The cross of thickness is assumed to be 60 for. Uh, the Bougeveld now is about 40 kilometers. We know it was thicker because we've lost a lot of uh, overburden. And so that was to be able to restore the loss of a burden. Uh, and the spreading here is, uh, is, is an artifact of this calculation. In reality, it will depend on the density difference between the stuff that goes down and the mantle. If it's, sink, if it's denser than the mantle, it will continue to go down. But in the bourgeois, it didn't go down. And that's something that's very interesting. We can discuss that if you want to. So that was the sinking regime. The sinking regime, at the initial emplacement level, there's not much that's left. There's a residual intrusion regime in which you're, you're having uh, the rocks now slightly colder. The temperature control here is the weakness of the surrounding rock. So they can be colder or intrinsically weak. And now that's a sequence of deformation. And you produce a final look at the time scale here. These things deform very slowly because they're colder. So deformation occurs much less rapidly than in the previous case. And in the end, you end up with a stable structure, again, spreading at the moho, but that's an artifact of the calculation. And uh, that's a funnel structure that is stable. At 9 million years, there's no more deformation. There's a bit of deformation left, but it's geologically negligible. It's less than 10 to the minus 20 second minus 1, so negligible. Temperature field, nothing surprising. But uh, that's the important thing. We have a residual intrusion regime because there's a big body that's left at the initial emplacement level. However, it's been strongly deformed. It has, you can see the difference between here and there. There's no, uh, there's not a simple relationship between the two. Uh, the residual body is not the same as the initial one. But basically, we've lost half of the volume to the moho, and we've left half of the volume at the. Uh, so uh, we'll come back to that later on. You can see the layers, how they, they deform. These are supposed to mimic it individual igneous layers. And you can see that they thicken towards the center. You can see that the, uh, the basal layer got stretched, and in fact, only lines up the wall to uh, below a certain depth. 
So there's uh, apparently some discordance that you would record in the Eleodemus rocks, and I will come back to that later on. So there's some very specific features of this type of instability and the way the deflection of the body uh, is, uh, is reflected into the, uh, the, the igneous layers that are left. So the foundering proceeds differently depending on the intrusion aspect ratio. So now we have a larger aspect ratio. These calculations are done exactly the same conditions, just to show you. So now we have a different uh, larger aspect ratio. And what you start to developing, instead of a centrally central down sagging, what you will produce is a series of instabilities, uh, which are akin to what are called the relative instabilities. But the instabilities always occur first at the edges, because this is where the, uh, where the intrusion is coldest, and develop these, uh, these patterns, because there's a competition between these different uh, and producing these, uh, these residual intrusion. The interesting thing is that you've thinned the central part. You have a thicker outer part and with dipping layers, and uh, there's no dipping layers there. A complicated pattern, which reflects the, uh, you can see again the time scales. We are, because we're in this res residual intrusion regime, the rocks are not deforming fast, so the time scale is, uh, is large. Now, this is a, a, the best we could to do the bush veld, so much shallower intrusion. And because it's shallow, at shallow depths, you've got very cold rocks. So you go, it's going to be very hard to deform those rocks. So most of the deflection will occur at depth. And you can see how the pattern evolves. And uh, the end result, 2 million years, then uh, basically nothing happens after that. You're left with a thick outer lobe and a thinner central region. And the thinner central region has lost its basal parts. Very important features that we saw in fact, I'll come back to that later on. So that's the residual intrusion regime. It's the most interesting one. How can we match this to the geological record? So before I go into this, let me summarize. I think what we've done so far is to say, OK, wh why do we want to look at the emplacement stage? Because of course, as we in place magma in the Earth's crust, we have a buoyancy flow that's acting, and it's unlikely that the reservoir will remain static. It will deform. There's going to be eruptions, of course, which will withdraw liquid, etc. But that thing is likely to deform. And if it's likely to deform, it's likely to spread. And so to spread to large distances. And that's going to be a function of the, of the volume that's available. It's also important to track the aspect ratio and the lateral extent of the uh, of this body, because as it crystallizes and cools, then it will generate different types of behaviors when it starts to founder. There's no doubt that uh, most basaltic intrusion should be involved in foundering, because we know that the mafic cumulates that they produce are denser than the country rock. And I've shown you examples from the, uh, from the uh, geological record. Of course, in, uh, you might have a complex situation in which you're still having a layered magma body with dense ultramafics and lighter uh, evolved rocks, say the anorthosites at the top. And we can discuss anorthosites for those of you who are interested. Anorthosites are plagioclase cumulates. And so there's going to be a density stratification within the reservoir. That's, of course, the next step. This calculation was done a year ago. So there's uh, many different things that we can investigate. But the basic story, I think, is there. You're going to start losing your mafix. And there's a second stage in your, in your magma body uh, when it's almost fully crystallized that's going to generate a completely different structure. And this is the structure that you're going to be able to observe in the field when you go to plutons. So does it make sense? That's a, a cross-section of the Great Dag of Zimbabwe. Why? It's because it's been studied at different sections. You can see the lowest exposed stratigraphic level is over there. Uh, because you, this is uh, stretched over 550 kilometers, it's a beautiful structure. I could have shown you, in fact, uh, it shows up very nicely on Google because it's so long and so big. You can see the width, something which is uh, uh, more than 10 kilometer wide, a big fat uh, intrusion body. And this is always some puzzling uh, uh, features for this type of intrusions. The Great Dark is not the only intrusion of its kind. There's many other ones. For those of you interested, uh, there's a nice intrusion called the Muskox which is uh, nice in Canada. There's also the Jimbalana in Australia. 
And it's always been a puzzle to petrologists, the fact that the layers could be dipping at such large dips. In fact, the Jimbalana is almost vertical. And all the uh, mechanisms that can produce igneous layering are always gravity driven. So it was always a puzzle. How can you derive uh, these different layers by gravity processes against a vertical wall? So, of course, this problem disappears if you assume that this thing was not horizontal when this uh, crystallization occurred. First thing. Second thing, there's always these uh, funny discordant structures at the walls. You can see uh, the border group, which is the earliest uh, crystallization crystallized part, and you see that it lines up the wall, but it disappears somewhere somewhere up. So there's some apparent discordance between uh, you would expect crystallization sequence to proceed from uh, border, dunite, pyroxenite, gabonorite. This is a typical sequence that you see in many of these intrusions. But the border group has been truncated. And the other layers are also truncated. So these discordance have always been a puzzle. And of course, the best way is to find out, to assume that uh, this is not the way the intrusion crystallized. It's the way the intrusion did deform after it has crystallized and produced these very dense cumulates. If you look at this uh, structure here, that's the funnel structure that we saw. And you can see we have the same features. The, this lower layer, that's the border group, it gets truncated. And there's, of course, you disappear, some of these layers disappear as you go up along the walls. And also, the other thing that we notice is that the, uh, the layers are thicker at the center. So all these features are, are, I think, can be very simply explained by this type of post-crystallization deformation. Same, same story. We could do higher resolution calculations. These calculations are not that long, but they take now on a fast, uh, they take about three days. So we could have done something a little bit more sophisticated. You have to deal with the definition over large distances laterally, because as we saw, if you deform over 40 kilometers vertical, then you have to at least have several times that distance horizontally to make sure that you're not influenced by your lateral boundary. So your domain is much larger than uh, this uh, blow up. If we go back to that structure, to the rum structure, if you remember, it's an interesting structure because it has, uh, uh, again, I think this, uh, this root. Now, this root is not well outlined by gravity, so that's the, the best the gravity people could do. In fact, uh, since then, people think uh, the gravity can't extend that deep. So I'm not going to say this is proof that there's a funnel structure there, but it's proof that there's this big, fat uh, uh, thing here, which is dense, because that's mapped by the gravity field. And I think it's very likely that it's due to the foundering. We don't have the. The interesting thing is I will uh, show you things near near the edges. That's what you see near the edge of the rum. That's the country rock. It's layered. You're at, you're sitting at the top, and very nicely. That's there's some interesting gretchen here. So the rock has been obviously uh, suffer, suffering, but you can clearly see that these uh, these sedimentary layers dip towards the intrusion. The intrusions here. You sit on the intrusion here. And so they're deformed. And I think that's also consistent with this type of, when you're higher up in the intrusion, you deform the country rock. But you'd, of course, you don't, of course, uh, deform it completely. You're still left, and you just have this mild deformation of the country rock. And I think that's remarkably uh, consistent with what we see here. Now, last but not least, uh, the different uh, regime that we saw. So for a given rheology, it, the, the depth of emplacement plays a, a role, but a small role. So here, we're not very sensitive to the, to the uh, per surface, but I've shown you cases for Rouchevel. That's the uh, summary of the different intrusion regimes, and different foundering regimes, sorry, as a function of background temperature. So uh, as you increase temperature, you, uh, you, of course, make the country rock weaker. And so you're going from sagging to sinking. What I would like you to introduce here, these calculations would, were made just with the hot initial intrusion. The country rock was cold or at the ambient temperature. So there was no thermal halo around the intrusion. And you can see how sharp the transition between these regimes are. The residual intrusion regime is confined to a temperature interval of about 100 degrees C, not, not big. And so you go from sagging to sinking quite rapidly. Sinking, you, there's not much left in your geological record. Sagging, uh, there's a lot of left intrusion record. 
and radio intrusions on it. But if you, if you allow for a thermal halo, because remember, this is the end stage of your working system, you had a lot of magma inputs in your system, you had developed a thermal halo. The thermal halo was scaled to, for example, the dimensions that we see in the bush veil, because the bush veil will have the metamorphic aureole. If you have thermal halo, that very sharp transition translates into a much wider transition, because simply you've got a wider area of uh, weakened rocks. So, uh, the uh, residual literature regime is, uh, uh, is uh, in fact, occupying a much larger uh, parameter space. And that's the end. Thank you.